Hey, are you ready to grow your business? You have checked out the number one resource for business leaders, entrepreneurs, startup founders, and managers. And we're going to teach you how to grow and scale your business with real actionable steps. There's no fluff in this podcast. It's just good advice. Check out this episode. If you're a first-time listener, make sure you subscribe to the podcast. And if you enjoy this episode, leave us a five-star review. Today's episode is with Esty Chazanow. She's the founder of Live Watches. She's talking about how she grew her business from an idea into a successful startup. Her journey is an awesome one. She really hones in on what it means to build raving fans for your business. You're going to love this episode. Stay tuned. Here comes your good advice. Hey, thanks for checking out another episode of the Good Advice Podcast. I have a special guest with us here today. It's Esty Chazanow. She's the founder of Live Watches, and she has an incredible entrepreneurial startup story for us today. Esty, thank you for joining me today. Hey, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Hey, I'm excited to have you joining all the way from, is it Miami? Is that right? Yep. Now, we're recording this around, uh, you know, it's, I guess right now it's the end of May. I'm not sure quite when this is going to go live, but it's COVID season, but it's also <laughs> beach season. What's it like in Miami right now? Well, they still haven't op- reopened the beaches. So okay. I, I'm on the beach. I <laughs> walk on the beach every day, but uh, not on the beach because they've closed that part off the boardwalks open. So we go out every day with the kids. Um, it's actually gorgeous weather right now. I mean, it was storming for and flooding a couple of days, but today was gorgeous. Uh, and it looks like overcast again now. Um, hmm. But anyway, it's, um, you know, it's, we're just waiting for the beaches to reopen, really. All the, all, all the condo pools, everything's closed still. The businesses have reopened, thankfully for that. Um, the schools are all still closed. My kids are here, so if anyone budges in the middle, <laughs> um, please excuse that. Um, we're hoping the camps will open. But yeah. My kids are still in school right now, so they're all on their Zoom classes now. I gotcha. So your kids are on Zoom. Now, I actually, 10 years ago, I was a high school teacher. A lot of people don't know that. I'm really fascinated with this whole online learning thing. Be honest, honest with me. How's it going? Is it working? Are they liking it? What's that? Okay, looking? I'm really, really blessed. My kids are very tech savvy. Good. Um, and they really love that. They're, they're, they're doing really well on it. Anyone I talk to is having a really hard time with it. <laughs> My kids' school has also stepped up to the plate really, really well. They made sure, for example, that all the break times are the same across the entire school. Mm. So that's really helpful so we can go out during breaks. So, um, yeah, my my. My kids are having a very positive experience with it. My daughter was also, um, my kids go to like um, a private Jewish school. So I wanted to supplement her, her, reg- her secular education. So she was already enrolled in an extra virtual school for the evenings and Sundays. So she already was, my, old, my, daughter, my older one was very comfortable. Um, so I was very lucky in that respect. Sorry, one second. <laughs> apologies um world war three was on the brink hey no <laughs> it's totally fine don't even worry about it seriously yeah, yeah so that's where we're at so your 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 kids are getting the they're getting educated still they're not uh you know Somewhat. out being yeah. hooligans yeah that's cool now are you still finding time to uh, you know your your kids are at home has that been a new normal or is that pretty typical for you guys in terms no, of we, your pacing we, no, I, I always go to the office. I like getting out. I, I'm, I find it very um, hard to be home. Um, I'm definitely, it, it's, it's definitely a challenge. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I'm in the office every day on a reg- in normal times. Now, I'm, I am pretty intrigued by your story because mm-hmm. I, I was reading about Live Watches mm-hmm. uh, and the product looks great. 
And, Mm -hmm. but even beyond the product, there's some really, there's some things I really want to unpack about how you got started. I'm really interested in you just as a person and Mm -hmm. what that entrepreneurial journey has been like for you. But there's some other things I want to ask you about with the watch in particular, and I'll get to that in a second. Before we get into that, tell me a little bit about you. Sure. How did you start this journey? What's that looked like for you? So I kind of landed into it by accident because, I mean, I don't believe really, in, you know, I, it, it was meant to be, and it's the best thing that happened. But um, I, I was never really, I, I didn't think of myself so much. I mean, in the sense, I was always a little bit entrepreneurial, but not the way my husband was. Um, I grew up in Australia, um, and I I studied business, and I also studied education. I was very involved with nonprofits, with, you mentioned teaching, curriculum writing. Um, I still do some stuff on the side <laughs> with my kids' schools and actually other schools. I, I, I do still do still do some work on the side in that because that is also a passion of mine. Um, but that was really kind of my path. And then I met my husband in 2009 uh, when we, we got married in 2009. And my husband was all from the moment we met, he was always talking about this dream of his is to start a watch brand. Um, and we finally, you know, we kind of, we were talking about it. And finally, in 2014, we went on Kickstarter with our first Kickstarter at the end of 2014. So our first watches were in existence in 2015 and delivered. Um, If I can just jump in at that part of the story, tell me about that that first Kickstarter because I was reading some of the stats on it and money you raised on it. And um, it's pretty surprising. So tell the audience a little bit about what that Kickstarter was like. Well, even just backtracking from the Kickstarter is uh, just giving a bit of background on my on my husband and myself and why we decided that we would be a great team together um, to work on this. So, at the time, there weren't really uh, there weren't really any direct to consumer Swiss watch brands brands that were creating Swiss watches, um, and it, it, my husband had been in the in the watch industry for many years. He had worked for a company. In, and he touched upon every aspect of the business, production, um, reselling. Um, so he was very familiar with all the different watch brands. He knew what was out there and he wanted some, to create something different that was at an accessible p- price point, but at the same time, um, something that would be really, really high quality. Mm-hmm. And so he um, he... That, that was really his dream. And he really wanted us to be direct to consumer. So our, our focus was really to create a brand that would be focused on creating connections with the customer. So that in the watch industry, I don't know if you're familiar with any watches, there are some really you know, big watch brands. No one has a direct connection with the people who make it. Mm. Um, and so that was really what his focus was going to be. So our focus really where I come in really was on educating people. And that is really what we become focused on. So I talked about creating content, um, but really on educating people on what our process is, the fact that we're different, how we're different, um, explaining the process that we go through to create a watch, um, why the need for our existence. And that has always been a huge part of who we are from day one. So my husband took his know-how in the watch industry and we merged it together with my understanding of education and educating people and bringing it together, we were able to create a really, really strong brand or micro brand, if you'd like to call. I was talking to someone the other day. He said, you guys are like a mature micro brand. I was hmm. like, oh, that's, that's a nice <laughs> definition. So hmm. that, that's really what we did. So but again, beginning with the Kickstarter, so I was always very involved in the messaging and the communication piece of it. While my husband was more involved in the production, um, uh, the production and the, you know, what moves the sourcing uh, um, and that side of it. And he, and together we're both very involved in the marketing piece as well, but we both focus on different aspects of it. 
So when so you back actually, to the Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. When you rolled out the Kickstarter, what did that look yeah. like? So we had no idea where it was going to go. So even before the quick Kickstarter, the way in which we um, actually came up with the design is we launched something called the Live Design Challenge, and we invited designers to submit designs. We couldn't afford to hire a full-time designer or anything like that to come up with designs. And so all our designs till now are really um, either directly taken from the winners of the design challenge back then in 2014, um, or they are offshoots of us continuing to work with a designer that designed a specific watch. And then we evolved it into different, different models within the same collection or whatever it is. So once we did that, we were able, the GX1 was the winning design. It was the first place winner. We actually, we had so many amazing, incredible submissions that we ended up making even more winners than the three winners. (laughs) Um, And we continue to use those designs. So the GX1 was the winning design from the design challenge. So we gave all the designers the brief and they came up with different designs and we helped them make them production ready. Um, so we didn't really know how it was going to go. We didn't know how it would be received by the Kickstarter community. Kickstarter was really, really hot then. Hmm. And we kind of just went on and we just kind of hoped for the best. We sent our family and friends a link. You know, we probably had a couple of pity purchases (laughs) from people (laughs) who felt sorry for us. Yeah. But then we ended up raising almost $200,000 in one month. People loved the design, and that continues to be our bestseller till now, the GX1. Wow. Yeah. It was, we were really very fortunate um, now, were in you, that respect. Were you, um, were you surprised um, we do, at all? I mean. Yeah. Yeah. We, <laughs> we did not do any marketing. It was really organic because the Kickstarter community back then was very strong. They weren't so burnt out yet. Um, and we really, and there were, there were a lot of people on Kickstarter that were into watches, so we relied on that. And it's funny, at the time, I didn't know anything about Instagram influencers or anything like that. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I had one guy reach out to me, and he's like, hey, if I pose, uh, pay me, it was a really small sum of money. But I'm like, no, I'm not paying this guy. I don't know who he is. And um, But eventually, I was like, you know what, I'll just take the plunge and go with it and we paid him a really small amount, but then as soon as he posted on his Instagram, it went up like twenty thousand dollars or something like that. The, wow! The Kickstarter, so it was an, it was probably the best return on investment we ever did. Um, but yeah, we did. It was very organic. Very no. By our next Kickstarter, we already had more of a clue in terms of our marketing. Yeah. Facebook marketing and so on and so forth. But the first one was really organic, and so I think that that is what really got our foot in. And those people, most of them have bought every single one of our watches. Wow. Okay. So, and that's, that's an interesting takeaway there is this whole concept of building raving fans for your business. And I want to tie it back to what you were talking about, you and your husband, originally you were thinking about this watch brand that would be direct to consumer. I don't know anything about watches. I don't, I don't wear a watch. I don't have one. I, I think the last watch I bought was like a $30 watch, like maybe a decade ago. So I don't what, know any, how old are you? I'm a uh, 30, 32 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, You're I right below the age group. That okay. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. Well, so, so, um, what I was going to say though is what I love about what you're talking about It's this angle to the business of going straight to the customer. And you said it yourself, building relationships. You know, and a lot of times this is, this is something that's really hot right now, but it's something that a lot of even new business owners struggle with is this concept of what does it mean to really build relationships with people rather than sort of chasing the sale. And it sounds like you guys have done a really great job with that because you've said it yourself. You have you have these raving fans now who literally buy watch after watch after watch. Well, I the first thing I always tell people when they ask me about it is that you've got to have a good product. Like you're not going to build raving fans over a piece of garbage. You're just not going to. You could do a lot of sales and have a lot of volume and tell, you know. You could sell a watch that cost you $10 to make for $30, 
and you could do a lot of sales, but you're not going to have raving fans on a, on a, on a, you know, it'll just be something, it'll be like someone buying a toilet paper roll. Like you don't have a relationship with a toilet paper roll manufacturer. So, but, but, yeah. but why, why does it feel like it, Yes. Yes. To what you're saying, but it feels like people like that very first caveat of, well, you got to have a great product. It feels like a lot of people blow past that and they say, yes, I do, but they don't, they think they do, but they don't. So well, they try to cut corners. They want to cut corners and they maybe want to have a really, really high profit margin. Um, but that's exactly, we've focused on creating a really really good product and not cutting any corners and it has affected us so for example in some of our kickstarter projects because we will never cut corners on quality we've made people wait longer than we wanted and that was in the short term you've got to see the big picture in mind so in the short term we had some really angry people Hmm. and they were running around writing terrible things about us you know not that many yeah all you need is one bad apple right but, um, but we just sucked it up and we said, no, we just continued. We were really firm about that message. You've you got to be really stubborn about it, especially when you're a young brand and you're afraid in a, in a sense of, of these people because you don't want them to, to, to request refunds and you don't, you know, but you, you just have to stay really strong and you have to say, no, we're not going to go ahead because – Quality is, and that was always our messaging. Whenever there were delays, it was always because of something wasn't right in the production, and we were not going to produce a product that was less than perfect. And if you look at all our reviews, that's all people say. They're like, "Oh, I own a Rolex." You're probably familiar with Rolex, at least. Yeah. Um, or I don't know if you know about any of the other brands like Audemars Piguet or Breitling. Mm. They'll always write in their reviews, "I own this, 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 and this watch." But this is now my go-to. It's e- the quality ex- matches or exceeds these really big brands that they pay thousands and thousands of dollars wow. for. So that you know, you've got to have the long picture in mind. It's hard. It's <laughs> it's really really difficult. But if you if you have a long range view, I think it's possible. And you're willing now, to take some some swallow some some yeah. negativity. <laughs> Now, but in, I mean, obviously in the moment, it's pretty challenging. Yeah. What, I mean, have you, have, now do you and your husband, do you guys sort of feed off each other in terms of staying positive or staying yeah. involved or, cause you know, it's, it's tough and it's not just, you know, a toxic review. Sometimes it's a customer who it's yeah. not a great customer even, and it's not your fault. It's just not a good customer, but it's tough in those moments when you get that negative review or those negative, negative things said about you to keep going and to stay as energized well, and committed. Like I said, uh, whenever we got a re- negative review about um, about a wait time or whatever, we just continually spewed the same message back. This is about quality. So, yeah, it definitely helps. I think that my husband and I, our hus- husband-wife team, were able to. And at the beginning, I was doing all the – we don't even call it customer service. We call it fan experience. Um, So I was having to respond to people and it was really hard for me because maybe naturally I'm more of a people's pleaser more than my husband's. He might be a little, not care as much about something like that, but it was very, very difficult, but, but that's fine. And, and in the long, and, and it was very short lived Mm -hmm. a few months later, it was over. So, um, and I, and as I built a team, I then, provide support to my team and I'm like don't worry guys we've been through this it's okay I, I mean thank god now we're dealing much less with it we have inventory on our website that people just go to livewatches.com and purchase it mm-hmm. um and we've got a much better predicting wait times and all that sort of stuff but but that that that's the name of the game and that's why our model has always been and will continue to be that we open for pre-orders first to fund the production, um, but the pre-orders are much less expensive than if you would buy it once it's already in stock. Right. Um, we really protect our retail pricing. Our pricing is very, very um, real. Um, so people know that we're being for real when we say that that's a pre-order pricing and the pricing is going to go up. You cannot find our product discounted anywhere. Um, no coupon codes. It's really an authentic retail 
So, um, so yeah, I continue. And we have an awesome, awesome team that we've built um, with really people who share our values. Our training just focuses on the human relationships. And we have a small lean team. We're not like, a, you know, we don't have 30 people working in the fan experience. But whoever we have share our same passion for relationship building, for quality, um, and we've been really fortunate to be able. I and I on every single email that goes out to um, a fan who's involved in the fan experience process, whether it's someone that you know e- um, emailed us because. Um, they want to know when they're getting their watch or someone who's emailed us because they want to know um, when uh, they, they, they have, they're having trouble working the watch. It's a mechanical thing. They don't know how to, they, they're not, they're unfamiliar. And mm-hmm. everything always has in the signature of the email says, you know, if you have any issues whatsoever with this communication, please email ST at Live Watches. Um, and I actually barely ever get people sending me issues. I often get people sending me, hey, this guy works for you, James. He's so cool. Just want to let you know. (laughs) Or Ernest is so awesome. I just want to let you know. Or we have people, we had one guy working in our office here in Miami and um, he he moved on to another position in another company. And I had people calling. I am trying to reach Carlos I just tell him I want to thank him. You know, the watch he recommended was awesome. So we've been really able to keep it within the company culture. Yeah. Well, I, personal relationship. I love just hearing you talk about, because, because in, in, you know, you being in the entrepreneurial space, you being in the yeah. business space, it's, it's, it's easy for businesses to talk about yeah. them valuing their customer and what they care about, but it's another thing to actually walk that out. And it's, it's, man, it's exciting to hear you yeah. keep pointing over and over again to how valuable the customer is, yeah. how valuable that experience is. There, there's, and, and I don't know about you, but I know for me, sometimes I come across people who they talk about, you know, customer service is what sets them apart, but they're really not, what no, they're offering yeah. from that experience really isn't any different from anyone else. Or even worse, I, I meet a lot of business owners who they are, um, you know, sort of suspicious of their customers. Like I had one guy who I was working with who he uh, sold protein powder. He mm-hmm. sold $200 of protein powder to a customer and the customer said, Hey, can you throw in a couple extra of those little plastic scoopers, you know, that always get like yeah. lost in the protein. Yeah. Thing. And, uh, which is totally fine. These things are plastic. They cost, I'm sure like 38 cents. Well, this guy's talking to me and he says, I felt like this customer was trying to take advantage of me. And I'm like, what is wrong with you? Tell them they can yeah. have as many scoopers as they want. I mean, they just yeah. spent $200 on you. Yeah. But they don't, they just don't think that way. And I don't, I don't know why that is. I don't know if you have any insight there, but all that to say, I, I it's love very short sighted. It in is. My yeah. 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 It's, and look, it could be the guy was having a bad day. He had to pay a lot of bills. It's, it, it, you know, you have to really be long side if you're going to be entrepreneurial. Like you have to think, you have to think of the road ahead. You have to, you can't look at other people and compare yourself to anybody else. You can't say, you know, why does this person have this now? I've been working so hard. You can't have any jealousy. You, you got to just keep. And I was reading one of the guys who was really instrumental in winning the Super Bowl, there was a really good article. I could send it to you. Yeah. My husband sent it to me. And he was saying exactly that, you know, that, that the way he was able to win was because he just kept looking at himself mm. and his journey and not looking at anybody else and just focusing on the, being the best that he can be. And I really, really, you know, there's, there's an old, Jewish like folk tale about um, this this old guy who they he, he said you know after 120 years God's not going to ask me how how was John how was Jake how was he's going to ask how were you how, you know did you accomplish your mission mm. but I really kind of that's always my approach with everything it's not it's not about anybody else it's about if you stay focused on what you are doing and don't get sidetracked and, and, and 
and then I think that you can really succeed. I really do. What, what, what's the secret to someone having that perspective? Because think about it. There's, I've noticed there's these two camps. There's the, there's the person who they, are, they look in the mirror every day and they, they're thinking about, you know, when they lose that customer, for example, they're thinking, okay, what, what do I need to do differently? How did I miss yeah. it? You know, they lose that employee. Okay, how was I? How do I need to change as a leader? And then there's the other camp, which is very, um, I mean, frankly, ego driven and maybe even narcissistic. And it's they lose a customer and they say, "Well, forget them. I didn't need them anyway." Or you lose an employee and it says, "Well, they were just lazy," or you know, right. "Oh, they're millennials." Well, listen, or, they'll they'll always be the customer or the employee that you probably didn't well didn't need anyway, or you know, they'll always be those. But in a general sense, absolutely, you need to be very self-reflective. Um, but I think that that needs to be with everything in your life. That's just the kind of people my husband and I strive to be, you know, whatever it is with your kids constantly asking, am I being the best parent? If that's your approach in general in life, then it will come naturally in business. I don't think it's a, it's specific to business. Am I being the best spouse that I can be? Am I being the best friend that I can be? Just constantly being self-reflective and not being happy with the status quo. Like just being having that growth mentality. I, I think I think that that's really, really what it is. I mean, I'm lucky that I have a framework because I come from like a Jewish religious background. So that is inbuilt. Mm. you know, in that. So I'm lucky that I have that. Um, but that's available to anybody. There's, you know, anyone who wants the tools. Yeah, well, and it feels like, I think what I like about what I'm listening to about you is, you know, you sound like someone who as painful as that sort of road of growth can be sometimes, it sounds like you very eagerly take that path. Whereas a lot of people, you know, it's like the weight of leadership, for example, everyone loves the perks of being the boss until you have to actually, you know, reflect and think about, am I being a good boss? Am I being a good leader? Am I being a good, you know, whatever that title is. And some people, they, even if they aren't being effective, they, it's too painful to change. And so they're willing just to stay as they are. And I think the people who can actually go on that journey and actually take those steps and say, yeah, this is painful and it does suck to know that I suck in these different areas. Those are the people who go on to do incredible things like your brand that you've built. Well, I remember when I was younger, my father once said, anything good in life isn't going to be easy. And it's so true. It's so true. You're building a family, whatever it is, whatever it is, it's not going to be easy. It's not going to. Even if you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth <laughs> and someone gave you money to start a business, it's not going to be easy. You need to figure it out. Like mm. money's not going to make a difference. You know what I'm saying? Like anything that you're going to really feel genuinely and authentically good about is going to be a struggle. That's just life. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that that's really what it, what it all boils down to. Um, and, and just really trying and just trying to always stay focused on the goal and don't get, I mean, I think I'm lucky in that my husband also really is a very positive in, he's a naturally very positive person. So he, he I'm a little bit less naturally like that's so have to work more on myself but i have that like cheerleader mm -hmm. you, know? you got this so working as a team is also really i think that definitely has been really helpful i'm not gonna lie it has not been easy and i always tell my when we started it was just my husband and i in this tiny office and every year for the past few years when we've actually had a team I say thank you guys for being here because otherwise, um, you know, one of us would have killed each other because it wasn't <laughs> easy being in an office by, by ourselves. Sure. But, um, yeah, I think, I think having, having the, your eyes on the goals really, really, I mean, it just sounds so cliche, but it's true. No, it, you know, I, I mean, what I've realized is like even these cliche, cliche isms are true <laughs> if people are willing to actually do the work. I, th I think that's what's tough yeah. about it is, I mean, think about how much, you know, the concept of servant leadership has been beat to death. It, it's not a new concept. And yet that is how you lead is by how do I, how do I open doors for my employees? How do I serve my employees? Yeah. 
So I, even these clichéisms, I think, are incredibly true. Something else I want to ask you, just because we're, we're running out of time, yeah. I want to ask you one other thing real quick, and then we'll, I'll, I'll give you a chance to talk a little bit about what's sure. happening as of late with Live Watches. Does it feel like today's culture that it's, it's harder to be an entrepreneur? And the, the reason I ask that question is because you're talking about not cutting corners. You're talking about it not being easy. And yet, I don't know if you spend any time on Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram, man, th- this, these platforms are saturated yeah. with digital marketers and what have yeah. you who are saying, hey, it is so easy. It's never been easier. Hey, I can tell you how to roll out your product and really even get to six figures in the next 30 days just by doing one, two, three, you know, these really <laughs> easy things. And it, I, you know, I have a, uh, an entrepreneurship group of people who, are, who I coach and mentor. And the biggest pain that I feel is their pain of where they've made a mistake of investing in one of these popular marketers and then realizing it was, it was too good to be true. It wasn't what they said it was. It feels like today's culture is so driven towards cutting those corners getting the immediate results, skipping the whole relationship. A hundred percent. But that, and that's why if you really have a quality product now, you can really stand out. Mm. It actually serves to your advantage that this is the culture now. A hundred percent. Yeah. I love yeah. that. That's but great. I, yeah. But it's, it's the truth. It really is. I mean, I see with everything, things that I buy, it, it's, it's true. If you, if you if you stay stick to your guns, then you'll end up you'll end up being able to stick out. Mm. No, Esty, we are out of time. This has been an amazing conversation. <laughs> Tell our listeners what's what's like the one thing they can do. What do you want them to check out? Uh, what do they need to do? Livewatches.com. dot com. Um, you could we have a, a, a stories section on our website if you want to learn more about our st- stories. Um, you know who we are, what we are. There's, 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 there's our, sorry, we have, we call it the journal. That's where our stories are. And we also have a section. If you look at the footer of the website, it says our story. You can read up about us there. Um, you always browse. We have, um, all, it's all men's. Um, but of course, women are welcome to purchase, but it's a men's sporty watch. Makes for a great gift. Uh, Father's Day. Um, and also, of course, for watch collectors or anybody who's looking to, I, I think we're, you know, men, uh, we always, people always ask us, how have the smart watches affected you guys? Because we're not a smart watch or a traditional watch. And my, and my husband actually always says, you know, um, we're lucky because they got, for a long time, people weren't, any, weren't, weren't wearing anything on their wrists mm. from the time that phones came out until smart watches came out, people stopped wearing anything on their wrists and smart watches got people back into wearing things on their wrists. There's a positive spin for you. I love that perspective. <laughs> but it, but it's true. <laughs> That's great. That is true. And people realize that they don't want to always be connected through a smart watch necessarily. They want something that's just old school. They can just see the time without having to get their WhatsApp messages. Yeah. So really fun wearing a watch. <laughs> And I encourage everyone to explore it. It allows you to get disconnected without having to look at the time on your watch, mm-hmm. on your phone. Um, so, yeah, ch- check us out, livewatches.com. We have a little chat on the bottom right-hand side of the, of the screen. There's usually someone available to answer. Really important to us. Cool. We try cool. to have 24-7. As, Esty, thank you for being here today. It's been great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your time. For our listeners, I will put livewatches.com. That's L-I-V watches.com. I'll put it in the episode description. Definitely check that out. Uh, the GX1, she mentions the bestseller. You should check that out as well. I'm looking at it now. It looks pretty cool. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, you never listened to it before, definitely make sure you subscribe to the podcast. We'll continue to bring you good advice with incoming guests. And as always, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave us a five-star review. Hey, that's all we got for you today. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you later. See ya.